From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The scale of this latest outbreak is, as well as being depressingly predictable, a direct consequence of the conflict. And had the parties to the conflict cared, the outbreak was avoidable. A massive outbreak of cholera is killing one person every hour in war-torn Yemen, as the death toll from the outbreak tops 859 people. Yemen's medical system is in shambles, but the U.S.-backed Saudi-led war shows no sign of letting up, as the Trump administration moves ahead with a $110 billion arms deal to Saudi Arabia. We'll go to Yemen to speak with Save the Children. Plus, we go to the streets of New York, where thousands took part in Sunday's Puerto Rican Day Parade. On the same day, Puerto Rico held a controversial referendum on political status. Brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico are in crisis. Uh, they're being deeply impacted by migration, by congressional inaction, and essentially by all of the debt that essentially the people have, are now responsible for that is to no fault of their own. Last year, half a million people migrated inland, and we really have to start talking about how we create infrastructures for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. And we'll look at two real estate investors advising President Trump, whose residents describe them as slumlords. Two new exposés show how Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and Trump's close friend, Thomas Barrack, have profited mightily off the backs of low-income renters. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Yemen, a civilian is dying nearly every hour from a massive cholera outbreak as the ongoing U.S.-backed, Saudi-led bombing campaign and naval blockade has devastated Yemen's health, sanitation and water systems. The World Health Organization says cholera has now killed at least 859 people. More than 100,000 are infected. This is the health ministry spokesperson, Abdel Hakim al-Khalani. The ministry had to announce the state of emergency. The ministry announced that it is powerless in facing this epidemic on its own and that we need international support and international organizations to aid in combating this epidemic. Last month, President Donald Trump signed a series of arms deals with Saudi Arabia, totaling a record $110 billion during his visit to Riyadh. United Nations monitors have warned Saudi-led airstrikes in Yemen could constitute crimes against humanity. Over 10,000 people have died since the U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign began in 2015. We'll go to Yemen for more on the cholera epidemic after headlines. In Syria, U.S.-backed troops fighting ISIS and Raqqa have been accused of deploying munitions loaded with white phosphorus, an incendiary weapon whose use in populated civilian areas banned under international law. Photos and video published by the local journalist group Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, show what appears to be white phosphorus filling the air over Raqqa on Thursday night amidst the U.S.-backed offensive to retake the city from ISIS. White phosphorus munitions can burn human flesh down to the bone, and wounds contaminated by the chemical can reignite up to days later, poisoning victims and leading to organ failure or death. An unnamed U.S. official told The New York Times the U.S.-backed forces fighting in Raqqa have access to white phosphorus munitions. The apparent use of white phosphorus came the same night as a U.S.-backed coalition airstrike reportedly hit an Internet café in Raqqa, killing as many as 14 civilians. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says one of the civilians killed was an activist who is in the middle of sending a report to the monitoring group when the airstrike destroyed the Ahassan Net. Internet Café. In Afghanistan, U.S. troops have been accused of killing a civilian and his two children outside his home this morning in Nangahar province. A local Afghan official says the U.S. troops opened fire, killing the three civilians, after the soldier's car was hit by a roadside bomb. Meanwhile, three U.S. soldiers were killed on Saturday, also in Nangahar province, when an Afghan army commando turned on the U.S. troops. The U.S. and Afghan army were in the middle of a joint military operation in Achin district when the killings took place. Six U.S. soldiers have died in Afghanistan so far this year.
In Iraq, at least 21 people were killed in a suicide attack on a market south of Baghdad Friday morning. The attack came as families were shopping for Ramadan. The U.S. war on terror continues to expand under President Trump. On Sunday, the U.S. military said it had carried out a drone strike in southern Somalia against the militant group al-Shabaab. It's the first known strike of its kind since President Trump relaxed the rules governing U.S. military operations in Somalia. The Pentagon says the strike killed at least eight militants when an armed Reaper drone launched from a U.S. military base in Djibouti dropped a series of Hellfire missiles on the al-Shabaab. Camp. Meanwhile, the Pentagon's also confirmed U.S. Special Operations troops are supporting Philippines troops fighting militants in Marawi City. An unnamed U.S. official told Reuters the U.S. support includes training, aerial surveillance and electronic eavesdropping. The U.S. has 300 to 500 troops in the Philippines, although they're reportedly not engaged in direct fighting. The militants linked to ISIS seized control of Marawi City on May 23rd. In the United States, the attorneys general of Maryland and Washington, D.C., are suing President Trump, accusing him of violating the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution by accepting millions of dollars in payments from foreign governments to his companies while serving as U.S. president. The lawsuit centers on the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., which is near the White House. Representatives of Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Kuwait have all stayed at the hotel since Trump's inauguration. The lawsuit is the first of its kind and comes as Trump is also facing multiple investigations investigations over his ties to Russia. Meanwhile, New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman says he's investigating the Eric Trump Foundation following a Forbes investigation that revealed Trump's son Foundation took $100,000 of donations that were supposed to go to children with cancer and instead funneled the money to the for-profit company of the Trump Organization. California Senator Dianne Feinstein is calling on the Senate Judiciary Committee to investigate Trump for possible obstruction of justice in the events leading up to Trump's firing of former FBI Director James Comey. On Friday, the day after Comey testified to the Senate Intelligence Committee, President Trump took to Twitter to attack him, tweeting, "'Despite so many false statements and lies, total and complete vindication and, wow, Comey is a leaker,' Trump tweeted. Comey testified Trump has lied about him and the FBI. Comey also said Trump pressured him to drop the investigation into former National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn during a private meeting that Comey said was inappropriate. Former U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara now says President Trump also made him feel uncomfortable during a series of phone calls. Bharara says he reported one of the calls to Attorney General Jeff Sessions' chief of staff because it made him uneasy. Bharara was fired less than 24 hours after refusing to take a call from President Trump. Attorney General Jeff Sessions will be testifying to the Senate Intelligence Committee Tuesday, although it's not yet known whether the testimony will be open to the public. Meanwhile, California Senator Dianne Feinstein is separately calling for Congress to look into Comey's statements during his Senate Intelligence Committee testimony that former Attorney General Loretta Lynch asked him to downplay his investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails during the 2016 presidential campaign. Formerly imprisoned Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning has given her first television interview after being released from prison last month. Getting all this information, and it's just death, destruction, mayhem, and eventually you just stop. I stopped seeing just statistics and information, and I started seeing people. There are those who say you, you may have been motivated to get the information into the public sphere, but you might have also given it to our enemies. Right, but I have a responsibility to the public. You know, it's not just about, you know, we all have a responsibility. That was formerly imprisoned Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning speaking with ABC's Juju Chang. Puerto Rico held a controversial referendum on its political status Sunday. Ninety-seven percent of those who cast ballots supported Puerto Rico becoming the 51st state. However, only 23 percent of eligible voters took part, because many Puerto Rican opposition parties boycotted the vote. This is Raul Torres explaining why he didn't vote in Sunday's referendum. 
Hoy no fui a votar, porque entiendo, siempre he votado en todo la... I didn't go to vote today. I've always voted in every election that I saw as legitimate. But I don't think today's election is valid at all, because the United States Congress isn't going to validate this referendum. And it's just something they are doing there, the party in power, to get a little closer to statehood. Statehood is a form of government that I don't like, first of all. And second, this is just a waste of money. Sunday's plebiscite in Puerto Rico came the same day tens of thousands turned out Sunday for the National Puerto Rican Day Parade here in New York City. Marchers at the New York Parade included Puerto Rican independence activist Oscar Lopez Rivera, who was imprisoned for 35 years. We'll hear voices from the march later in the broadcast. President Trump may cancel his planned state visit to Britain amidst fears of mass protests. Nearly two million people in Britain have signed a petition saying Trump should not be invited to make an official state visit because it would cause embarrassment to Her Majesty the Queen, unquote. London Mayor Sadiq Khan has also called for Trump's state visit to Britain to be canceled after Trump misquoted then berated the mayor following the attack in London earlier this month. Crowds of demonstrators shouted down Islamophobic protesters in more than a dozen U.S. cities Saturday. The Islamophobic rallies were organized by the anti-Muslim hate group Act for America, but in most cities, the counter-protesters greatly outnumbered those who turned out for the Islamophobic rallies. Protesters were arrested in Seattle, New York City and St. Paul, Minnesota. In California, a group of undocumented Central American and Mexican asylum seekers are launching a hunger strike inside the for-profit Atalanto Detention Center this morning. Most of the hunger strikers were part of a caravan of refugees who spent April and May crossing through Mexico to reach the United States border to ask for asylum. They've been incarcerated in the GEO Group-owned Atalanto Detention Center since reaching the U.S. border. This is hunger striker Isaac Lopez Castillo. The reasons for our hunger strike are, one, bail set at impossibly high levels, two, denial of the right to political asylum, three, humiliation and discrimination towards the detained, four, facilitation of the paperwork and processing of the detained, five, bad food, six, incompetence of medical staff, seven, paperwork in English. Uber's board of directors has forced out a top executive and is considering a leave of absence for CEO Travis Kalanick amidst a slew of scandals at the Wall Street-backed ride-hailing company. Kalanick has faced widespread criticism after Bloomberg News published a dash cam video of him arguing with and insulting an Uber driver in an expletive-filled tirade earlier this spring. A number of women workers at Uber have also reported widespread sexual harassment within the company. Last week, Uber fired 20 workers over sexual harassment. Tens of thousands of people took to the streets for pride marches Saturday and Sunday in cities across the United States. In multiple cities, LGBT activists, led by queer women of color, staged disruptions of the pride marches themselves in order to protest the increasing corporatization of pride. The D.C. Capitol Pride Parade was the site of major disruptions Saturday, as activists with the group No Justice, No Pride blocked the street with a sign reading, War Profiteers Have No Place in Our Community. Unquote. The group is demanding Pride scale back the police presence at the march and cut ties with its corporate sponsors that profit off war and fossil fuel extraction, including the companies Wells Fargo, Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems and Northrop Grumman. In Orlando, Florida, hundreds of people gathered Sunday night for a vigil to honor the 49 people who were killed at the Pulse nightclub massacre one year ago. The shooting at the LGBTQ club was the deadliest mass shooting in recent U.S. history. The majority of those killed were young LGBT people of color. During Sunday night's vigil, 49 people dressed as angels carried candles as they surrounded the club, which is being converted into a memorial to honor the massacre victims. Last night, the Tony Awards. Among those who gave political speeches were Cynthia Nixon, who won Best Featured Actress for her role as an abused woman in Lillian Hellman's play, The Little Foxes. It is a privilege to appear in Lillian Hellman's eerily prescient play at this specific moment in history. 
80 years ago, she wrote, there are people who eat the earth and eat all the people on it and other people who just stand around and watch them do it. My love, my gratitude, and my undying respect go out to all the people in 2017 who are refusing to just stand and watch them do it. And former U.N. General Assembly President Father Miguel de Scotto has died in Nicaragua at the age of 84. The Marino priest was a longtime critic of the United States in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is Father Miguel de Scotto talking about the United Nations in an interview with Democracy Now! in 2010. It's a fraud. What do you mean they have veto power over it? Who's they? Uh, the, the, the Security Council. And the countries in particular on the Security Council? Uh, there are, within the Security Council, there are five countries that have veto power. And, but without a doubt, the most influential country in the United Nations is the United States. And, and it's really, really amazing. The most warmongering country in the history of mankind is put there in charge to make sure that there is peace. Father Miguel de Scotto has died at the age of 84 in Nicaragua. We did that interview in Bolivia. To see the whole interview, you can go to democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. In Yemen, medical groups are warning an outbreak of cholera has infected more than 116,000 people. The World Health Organization says a waterborne illness has claimed the lives of at least 859, and Oxfam estimates cholera is claiming one life every hour in, in, in Yemen. Children under the age of 15 account for 46 percent of the cases. The WHO says the number of cases could reach 300,000, as the outbreak has now spread to 20 of Yemen. 22 provinces. Yemen's health care system is also on the verge of collapse, as many hospitals have shut down because of the ongoing U.S.-backed Saudi war. Only 45 percent of Yemen's hospitals are still operational. This is Dr. Hussein Al-Haddad, the director of one of the few hospitals in Sana'a that is still functioning. The situation is very bad. The children that are suffering from cholera are countless, and there aren't enough beds. The technical know-how in the hospital is also insufficient to deal with the situation we are facing. The cholera epidemic comes amidst a U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen, a naval blockade that's left Yemen's sanitation, water and health infrastructure in shambles. The United Nations warned some 19 million of Yemen's 28 million people need some form of aid, with many of them at risk of famine. This is U.N. Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien addressing the United Nations Security Council late last month. Yemen now has the ignominy of being the world's largest food security crisis, with more than 17 million people who are food insecure, 6.8 million of whom are one step away from famine. Crisis is not coming. It is not even looming. It is here today, on our watch, and ordinary people are paying the price. It is important to bear in mind that malnutrition and cholera are interconnected. Weakened and hungry people are more likely to contract cholera and less able to survive it. According to estimates, 150,000 cases are projected for the next six months in addition to the broadly 60,000 current suspected cases since last April, with 500 associated deaths. The scale of this latest outbreak is, as well as being depressingly predictable, a direct consequence of the conflict. And had the parties to the conflict cared, the outbreak was avoidable. That was U.N. Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien addressing the U.N. Security Council last month. President Donald Trump signed a series of arms deals with Saudi Arabia, totaling a record $110 billion during a visit uh, to the Saudi capital. The arms deal includes tanks, artillery, ships, helicopters, missile defense systems and cybersecurity technology. United Nations monitors have warned previous Saudi-led attacks on Yemen could constitute crimes against humanity. 
Over 10,000 people have died since the Saudi bombing campaign began in 2015. For more, we go to Sana'a, Yemen, where we're joined by Anas Shahari of Save the Children, Yemen. He joins us uh, from the capital. Welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us the scope of the problem. Uh, the problem is uh, very massive. <clears throat> Excuse me. The problem is very massive. It's like we are facing a very uh, uh, critical situation here. Uh, a lot of people are suffering from cholera. Uh, I just uh, received uh, uh, an SMS from uh, one friend in a village uh, just before this uh, interview. He's telling me that the cholera is spreading in Hajjah governorate, and people are struggling to get medications. And you can imagine, every day, the numbers are increasing. The upsurge is very scary. Uh, we have to deal with, with all of these cases as Yemenis and humanitarian organizations are struggling to respond to the needs of those people with, with very short uh, uh, funding. Uh, you know that uh, Yemen is facing a uh, hard economic situation. The, the uh, health uh, system is collapsing. We have uh, a lot of social uh, services uh, that are not available. I can give you examples, for example, uh, just uh, uh, a month or more than a month ago, uh, garbage collectors were on strike because they were not paid their salaries. And uh, it was rainy. And this was one of the reasons that contributed to the cholera outbreak, which is, which is the second outbreak. And it's, it's three times uh, uh, more horrific than the previous one. <laughs> And how are our medical personnel able to function, uh, given the, uh, the continuing uh, air war of Saudi Arabia, as well as the, uh, the armed conflicts within the country? You know, people in, in, uh, in, in uh, cities where armed conflict is, is, uh, is now ongoing are suffering the most, because they don't have hospitals to go to. They, there are no medical staff. And generally, people in, 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 in Yemen are suffering because salaries have not been paid to the public servants for about nine months. Uh, this gives doctors, nurses, everybody a hard time because they, don't, they cannot go to hospitals. They cannot afford anything. Um, I can give you example. For example, now ch children in Yemen, 8.1 million children cannot afford uh, healthcare services cannot afford uh, water to drink or sanitation services. Uh, this, this, this number is very, very large. If we are talking about the health system and, and, and the, 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 water, the water grip in the country, uh, every time I go to a hospital, I, I keep uh, hearing doctors complaining because they haven't received their salaries to come to the hospital. And you can imagine a doctor can barely afford transportation to go to a hospital to save lives. And recently, when I was in the hospital, I saw a lot of people lying on the ground because the outbreak happened suddenly. And people went to a hospital here in Sana'a, and they were lying on the ground. They were staying in tents in, a, in an isolation unit in a serene hospital here. Uh, it was, was a very horrific situation. And everybody was suspecting uh, cholera in their houses, for example. I always, I'm always suspicious after I come back from a hospital. It's like maybe I will eat something that will, will, will infect my body with the cholera, then I'll, I'll need to deal with it just like everybody else. So it's, it's, it's a whole package of hardship that we're facing in Yemen. Anna Shahari, we have just reached one of your colleagues, Dr. Mariam al with Save the Children in Yemen. Right now, she's joining us in the field from Hodaida governorate in Yemen, where she's treating cholera patients. The phone connection is not very good, so, folks, listen carefully. Uh, Dr. al thank you so much for joining us. Explain what you're seeing where you are. Um, Welcome. Yes, yeah. I'm in Hodeida Governorate, one of the affected governorates suffering from cholera. And what do you see? You're treating people with cholera now? 
Uh, we, we through the military, through treating people of cholera, we see a lot of cases, we saw a lot of cases in the area treatment center, which is, I mean, there is two main hospital centers in, uh, for uh, treating cholera, a lot of cases there. But the problem is that the cancer is not in, and with the very hot weather, and even uh, the, the fuel is very expensive because there is no electricity to so imagine with cholera and uh, very hot weather the situation becomes uh, worse. The, the due to shortage of um, uh, medical supply and uh, treatment, we try to do the best. And uh, also, as uh, my colleague Anas mentioned, the health system collapsed. So there is no salary, no running cost of uh, the hospitals or health centers. This is make the situation is very bad. And and what are you and calling now, uh, by the way, most of the cases they are children, for example, I can give you a data. Since the mid of the May to now, uh, Al Salah Khan Hospital received more than one thousand seven hundred cases and uh, four uh death case uh, reported. Uh, uh, we're trying to go back to uh, Nash Shahari. What do you think the world needs to do, or uh, what are you calling for in terms of assistance to the people of Yemen at this time? Well, see, save the children uh, and uh, the, wider, uh, the wider humanitarian community are urgently uh, requiring more funds to expand the response and to manage and mitigate and prevent this outbreak. And uh, we need uh, also uh, the international community uh, to contribute to this to this crisis, which which is considered the biggest crisis in the world, and increase the funding here. We also have a message to the uh, UN and to the conflicting parties to facilitate and 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 uh, resume the the public sector salaries, like to put pressures on whoever is, is concerned, and just to resume the public sector salaries so that people can go back to work in hospitals and, and uh, other governmental institutions. We also ask all, uh, all, uh, AG, uh, uh, all conflicting parties to facilitate our access to the areas where we need to go and save lives. Uh, earlier, we're, we're, this, we're, uh, earlier this month, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei accused President Trump of double standards, saying his administration turned a blind eye to Saudi Arabia's bombing of Yemen while claiming to promote human rights around the world. It's almost two and a half years since they, the Saudis, have been bombing Yemen, not military installations, but streets, markets, mosques, hospitals and civilian houses, killing innocent people, women, children, adults. They're killing everyone. And then they, the U.S. president, goes to them, Saudi Arabia, and stands by their side and they chat with each other, they dance with each other, and they speak of human rights. And then they place sanctions against the Islamic establishment of Iran because of human rights. So, Anas Shahari, can you talk about the connection between war and cholera? Well, the war, uh, the war has destroyed uh, all the infra—it's like most of the infra infrastructure we have here in the country. We don't have any uh, sanitation uh, system. The water network is destroyed. We don't have electricity. People who need to boil water before drinking it do not have the cooking gas. Fuel is very expensive, as Dr. Maryam said. The economy uh, of the country is, is collapsed, has already collapsed. The health system has collapsed. I mean, uh, the war has destroyed everything in this country. And as, Ye as a Yemeni person, what I am looking for here is, is to stop this war to find peaceful solutions between the parties in order for, for the children who are paying the heaviest price to continue their lives and to see brighter futures. And in terms of the, uh, the refugees, people fleeing uh, Yemen uh, to escape the violence and the bombing and the, and the collapse of the, uh, basically, of the total infrastructure of the country, are people continuing to flee the country? Um, in the beginning, large numbers of people were fleeing, and uh, uh, about uh, three million people uh, flee fled their houses. But now this number has decreased. But people are moving from place to place uh, because the conflict sometimes arises in some areas. For example, in an area in Ta'az al-Mukha, 
there was a conflict that erupted and people had, had to leave their homes. And this is also uh, leading to other problems like uh, children dropping classes, not going to schools anymore. And now we are left with children that are abandoned behind and they don't know what their future holds. Last month, thousands of Yemenis <clears throat> rallied in the capital, Sana'a, to protest the U.S. arms deal with Saudi Arabia and President Trump's visit to Riyadh. This is the Yemeni journalist Nasser al-Rabi. We are here today to say no for terrorism, no for American terrorism. And we are here to say to Trump, you kill Yemenis with Saudi hands. You support Qaeda ISIS by supporting Saudi Wahhabi regime. And ask, can you respond as we wrap up? Well, uh, I am a Yemeni person, and I can tell you what we need in this country. We need, number one, peace. And then, number two, we need uh, uh, increasing funds to respond to the humanitarian need. Uh, we don't need any more weapons to come to this country. We don't need any more war. We need to live in peace. We need, we need to respond to the needs of those uh, outside who are starving, who are dying because of cholera, who, who do not find the most basic services and needs in life. Anas Shahari, we thank you for being with us, media officer for Save the Children, speaking to us from Sana'a, Yemen. We wish you the very best yourself as well and for your protection. This is Thank Democracy you. Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, the Puerto Rican Day Parade here in New York and the plebiscite on the island of Puerto Rico. Stay with us. No se preocupe, paisano. Las cosas están en orden. No se preocupe, paisano. Las cosas están en orden. Burned Out There by Estrella Artau. And a shout out to the students visiting Democracy Now! today, the CUNY School of Journalism Night Summer Internship and the New York Youth Leadership Council. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Tens of thousands turned out Sunday for the National Puerto Rican Day Parade here in New York. The parade came on the same day when Puerto Rico held a controversial referendum on political status. Ninety-seven percent of those who came cast ballots voted in favor of Puerto Rico becoming the 51st state, but just 23 percent of eligible voters took part. Many Puerto Rican opposition groups boycotted the vote. Juan, you have followed this extremely closely. Talk about what happened. The governor, Rosselló, has called this a great victory for statehood. Yes, it's actually probably the poorest showing that this pro-statehood uh, party has had in about 50 years, uh, the re because so few people voted. You, you have to understand, in, in Puerto Rico, it's, it's uh, normal for 78 to 80 percent of the people to vote uh, in, in a normal election or plebiscite. You're talking 23 percent. So the statehood party got a little over 500,000 votes. Uh, in back in 2012, in, during the last uh, plebiscite, uh, statehood got uh, 834,000 votes. So they got 300,000 fewer votes than they did in uh, in the uh, in the 2012 uh, plebiscite. Uh, the reality is that with the economic crisis that Puerto Rico is facing right now, the last thing on the minds of the people of Puerto Rico is a vote over statehood that Congress. They know that Congress cannot uh, or will not. Uh, grant. Uh, so, what the governor has said is that he's going to now, based on this 97 percent 
uh, vote in favor of statehood, uh, will now uh, elect two United States senators and five congressmen uh, and send them to Congress and demand admission as a state. Uh, this is a, a tactic that uh, Tennessee used in the 19th century to pressure Congress to admit Tennessee as a state. So they're now going to go through an election of, a, of two senators and five congressmen, which will again be boycotted by the other parties, so only the statehood people will vote. Uh, and the reality is that the economic crisis of Puerto Rico at this point uh, cannot be resolved just through a statehood process. There has to be a process of real self-determination for the island of Puerto Rico that has not happened yet. I want to turn right now to Sunday's uh, Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York. Marchers at the parade included Puerto, uh, Puerto Rican independence activist Oscar Lopez Rivera, who was imprisoned for 35 years. This year's organizers chose to organize Lopez Rivera as the parades to honor him as the parade's first national freedom hero. But after a boycott campaign that was organized by a right wing conservative group funded by donors close to both President Trump and and to Breitbart News, Oscar Lopez Rivera announced he would march not as an official honoree, but as a humble Puerto Rican and a grandfather. Well, Juan, um, you were at the parade on Sunday. <laughs> Forty Fourth Street and Fifth Avenue, getting ready for the start of the annual Puerto Rican Day Parade. Thousands of people are here to celebrate the culture and the history of Puerto Rico. There are others also protesting. My name is Carlene Pinto, and I work with the New York Immigration Coalition. Our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico are in crisis. Uh, they're being deeply impacted by migration, by congressional inaction, and essentially by all of the debt that essentially the people have, are now responsible for that is to no fault of their own. Last year, half a million people migrated inland, and we really have to start talking about how we create infrastructures for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. This is an especially controversial parade because of all of the companies uh, that have boycotted the parade at the last moment and, and some of the public officials uh, because the parade has uh, decided to honor Oscar Lopez Rivera, the Puerto Rican activist and former leader of the FALN who was freed from prison after 35 years in prison uh, by a commutation by President Obama. So many of these companies have boycotted the parade, but in the Latino and the Puerto Rican community, many folks are saying that corporate America does not get to determine who are the freedom fighters and the heroes of any community. And so most, if not all, of the organizations of the Puerto Rican community who annually participate in the parade have continued to participate, uh, with the exception of a few, the Hispanic Society, the Police Department, the Hispanic Society of the Fire Department, but all the others have agreed to participate, and as they always do in the parade, to stand up for the history, the culture, and the contributions of the Puerto Rican community to American life. Giovanni Ortiz. I represent the organization Positive Workforce. We are a hardworking community um, organization with black and Hispanics. Today is Oscar Lopez. He is going to be marching our parade today. Hi, my name is Danny Camacho. I'm with the Hispanic Society of New York City Transit. We're here to celebrate Puerto Rican pride. We try not to get political. We're solely interested in expressing the Puerto Rican presence. I would say at transit, there are about 6,000 Hispanics in total. As far as the Puerto Ricans are concerned, it's, it's a percentage of that, probably about 50 percent. On the island of Puerto Rico, there is a referendum being conducted by the pro-statehood government, government of Puerto Rico, uh, a, a plebiscite that has itself created much controversy because all the other major political parties on the island have boycotted it and have insisted that now is not the time to have a 
a beauty contest, in essence, on Puerto Rico's status, given the enormous economic crisis uh, that is confronting the island of Puerto Rico, close to 200 schools about to be closed uh, this coming school year, massive uh, austerity cuts, increases in electricity rates, massive poverty continues to dog the island. They're saying the political leaders should be dealing with this economic crisis, not having a costly referendum where only one party is participating. Uh, my name is Gabriel Rivera. I'm here with the United Federation of Teachers, I'm here to support Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, we got to keep the schools open, the kids are the future. Well, I'm Esa Heredia. Um, I'm a current political science student in the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Um, we had an ongoing strike that lasted 70, 62 days, but the paralyzation was 71, um, defending Puerto Ricans' right to an accessible public education, which is right now undergoing $450 million in cuts planned by the Fiscal Control Board. I actually wish that Puerto Rico could become free and be able to um, run its own destiny. My name is Franklin Flores. I'm here to support Oscar Lopez Rivera and the uh, independent movement of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a colony in the United States and we have to fight for our freedom. If Puerto Rico comes a state, it will be the suicide of the Puerto Rican nationality. This is Juan Gonzalez for Democracy Now! here at the Puerto Rican Day Parade of 2017. <laughs> Yes, tens of thousands of people came out to the parade. Juan, final comments on what took place yesterday, both here in New York and on the island of Puerto Rico. Well, it was important that not only the, the contingent marching with Oscar Lopez Rivera was supporting of him, but many of the other groups uh, in the parade. The, for instance, the Hispanic carpenters uh, had uh, pictures of Oscar Lopez Rivera that they were carrying as well. So, several of the other groups. The participation in the parade was, was significantly lower, even on the sides from previous years. I think part of the problem has been, obviously, that the Puerto Rican community is smaller in New York City than it used to be. Uh, many of the other Latino communities around the country have their own annual Puerto Rican Day parades now, and the controversy did scare some people away. But still, it was an extraordinary showing and an extraordinary sense of unity uh, uh, in the parade by the Latino community to say the parade committee chooses who the heroes are, not corporate America. And I think that's the key thing that has to be understood from this year's parade. And, of course, we'll continue to cover what's happening in Puerto Rico, the bankruptcy. Um, just tune in here to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, a fascinating two-part discussion from Baltimore to um, renters around the country. What's their connection to the president of the United States? Stay with us. Drink my blood of courage and try to take away my fight. But no, 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 they can't do that. No, for one truth I learned in life you want to scare away the vampires, you simply guide them into the light. But when I wake up, Life. I'm Michael Franti here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The beleaguered tenants of Kushnerville. That's the headline of a recent piece in ProPublica about the real estate dealings of Trump's son in law and White House senior advisor Jared Kushner. The, the piece looks at how Kushner's former company, Kushner Companies, has acted as a, quote, neglectful and litigious landlord of low-income housing units in Baltimore. ProPublica reporter Alec McGillis chronicled how Kushner Companies hounded low-income tenants with a barrage of lawsuits, eviction notices and late fees, even when the tenants were in the right. Tenants also described terrible maintenance practices, which created nearly unlivable conditions for some families. Alec McGillis, welcome to Democracy. 
Democracy Now!, joining us from Baltimore, uh, where you exposed this story. Tell us what you found. Well, what I found was uh, just way beyond what, what I was even expecting when I first started looking into these complexes. Um, Jared Kushner's family company has 15 of these complexes in Baltimore, with about 8,000 units. Uh, it's by far his biggest concentration of sort of downscale rental holdings in the, in the entire country. And what I found when I looked into the, into the court system, just to check and see if they had any cases in the court system, um, was just an incredible profusion of cases that the company had brought against tenants and former tenants, hundreds and hundreds of cases, uh, more than the court system could even display at one time. And, and basically what the company has been doing for the last five years since it bought these complexes is going after just about any tenant they possibly could to squeeze more money out of them for back rent or having allegedly broken a lease, even in cases, um, as you said, where the tenant really was in the right. And, uh, Alec, many of these tenants were what's called Section 8 tenants, in that they were getting housing vouchers from the federal government uh, to pay their rent. Uh, and uh, But Jared Kushner has said he wouldn't weigh in on any policy having to do with Section 8. Uh, do you still see any potentials for conflicts, given how much his, uh, his family's uh, company was invested in uh, uh, and using these Section 8 certificates, which are now probably the biggest public housing expenditure? Of the federal government? No, there's definitely a concern around this. Um, he, he has the White House has said that he would absent himself from any any uh, policy uh, debates around Section 8 uh, funding, but you, you can never be sure with this White House if that if that word will hold true. The fact is that in the current budget, the Trump administration budget, the cuts to Section 8 funding, while large, are not nearly as large as the cuts to actual public housing housing funding for actual public housing authorities. And with this White House, one, of course, can't help but wonder if there's some connection um, back to the fact that, that the Kushner Company does rely so much on Section 8 funding for, um, for these complexes. Um, the company is called JK2 Westminster LLC. Um, explain Jared Kushner's relationship to it, and then tell us a story of a tenant. So, uh, JK2, is, it, Westminster is indeed the name of the, the, the entity through which they were bringing a lot of these, these cases. Uh, and Jared Kushner, and it's the, when one can only presume that the JK stands for Jared Kushner, although the company would not confirm that. Um, Jared Kushner had a very pivotal role in buying these complex, complexes. He, you know, has been, was in the process of, of inheriting this company from his father, and, and this was one of his big moves to make these, to make these purchases. He saw them as a just a wise, uh, a very lucrative uh, and prudent financial investment to buy all these complexes. One of the people that I uh, came across with an especially, you know, just very upsetting story was a young woman, a single mother of three, who moved out of one of the complexes because the her the elderly woman next door was um, just becoming incredibly hard to, to deal with, banging on the door at night, waking up her her baby, um, just acting very strange. So she got permission. Uh, this young woman got permission to move out. Um, she got written permission to move out. She gave the proper notice and all that. She moves out. A couple years later, she starts getting court notices in the mail saying that a company that she'd never heard of, JK2 Westminster, was suing her in court for several thousand dollars for having left her lease early. She unfortunately did not have a copy anymore of that written permission that she'd received. The court ruled against her. Um, with the late fees and interest and all that, it came to $5,000. Um, there's no—she could not afford that. She was a home health aide, working minimum wage. She, her wages started being garnished. Her bank account was garnished. She was completely cleaned out, uh, went broke. She finally did manage to get a copy of that form, showing that she had permission to move out, and that did not help her in court. The court uh, remained unmoved against her. She ended up getting a big court lien against her. Her, her credit record has been ruined by, by this whole thing. Um, it's, it's, it's been extraordinary. And this, this was just this was a very typical of the kind of thing that, that, that the Kushner Companies was doing with former tenants. And, Alec, what was the strategy behind these acquisitions? You, know, you normally associate the Kushners with more upscale uh, development. Were they, was this an attempt to uh, gentrify these uh, developments and renovate them, or was it basically to milk the existing tenant base without doing much uh, improvements of, of the complexes? 
It was really more the latter, actually. These, these complexes were seen as, as a way to generate cash flow for the company. The company is, of course, better known for its uh, very high-end holdings in Manhattan. Uh, those holdings tend to be very highly leveraged, um, with lots of lots of debt. Um, this, these complexes were, were in, in, a sen in essence, kind of provided ballast to the company, just a, a, a very steady cash flow. When you think about it, these, these, the rents in these apartments are uh, not high by Manhattan standards. We're talking about $1,000, $1,100, $1,200 a month, typically. But you multiply that by 8,000 units just here in Baltimore, and then, and then you add on all these, the, this extra revenue coming in from this very aggressive uh, legal pursuit of tenants and it, it really starts to add up. And what was the response of the Jared Kushner company? And how has he changed his relationship with JK2 Westminster LLC since he became a chief advisor to President Trump, his father-in-law? Well, uh, uh, Jared Kushner did step back from the company back in, uh, Decem in December or January. He stepped down from his role as the CEO of Kushner Companies. And his father, Charles Kushner, is now back in that in that in that title. But Jared has retained uh, virtually his entire stake in the these real estate holdings, um, whether the these downscale apartment complexes or the higher end stuff. He's retained um, the vast majority of those stakes. His stake in the company is estimated as as being as much as six hundred million dollars. Um, as far as the company's response to my questions, it was very blunt. They said these are we were going after these tenants because these were these are contracts that they've signed these leases, and we are simply upholding the contracts. Um, they did not have specific responses uh, to some of the specific cases I brought to them, like the case of the young woman I just described. The, they also said that what they were doing was in line with industry industry behavior. However, um, I talked to a lot of people in, in the industry who described to me, uh, well, characterized this behavior as being sort of on the outer edge of what's considered normal in in this in the world of, of sort of downscale uh, apartment complexes. Alec McGillis, I want to thank you for being with us. Reporter for ProPublica's piece appeared in The New York Times with the headline, Jared Kushner's Other Real Estate Empire. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, well, we end today's show looking at the real estate dealings of another one of Donald Trump's closest associates, Thomas Barrack. Last week, the reporter Aaron Glantz of the investigative news site Reveal exposed how Barrack profited off the housing crisis by buying 31,000 single-family homes, mostly foreclosures, then bumped up the rents and, in many cases, allowed the properties to fall into disrepair. Glantz reported that Barrack's actions as head of Colony Starwood Homes made him tantamount to a modern day slumlord. On Friday, one day after Aaron Glantz's piece was published, Tom Barrack sold all of the stock in Colony Starwood Homes and resigned his position as co-chairman of its board of trustees. To talk more about his piece, Aaron Glantz joins us from San Francisco. He's senior reporter at Reveal. Aaron, so your piece looks like it certainly had a major effect, but explain what you found. Well, Tom Barrack is one of Donald Trump's oldest and closest friends. He introduced uh, Ivanka Trump at the Republican National Convention. He planned Trump's inauguration. And if you watched Donald Trump take the oath of office, he was actually standing uh, right behind uh, the Trump family as uh, Trump was sworn in. And, and uh, The New York Times said that he's one of the few people uh, that Donald Trump trusts. So, started to look into uh, this guy's uh, real estate business. And uh, he's one of these real estate businessmen who has made his career on profiting off of other people's pain. And his big play after the Great Recession uh, was to start buying up foreclosed homes all over the country, um, which used to be owned by families, and turn them into rentals. And so the company uh, that he founded eventually became known as Colony Starwood Homes with 31,000 homes across 10 states. Uh, and uh, I started to get especially interested in this company after the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta found that in one county in the Atlanta area, Fulton County, uh, this company had filed eviction notices against one-third of its tenants. Tell us the story of one woman um, who is holding her infant in bed 
when an air conditioner fell out of the ceiling onto them. Yeah, this was uh, Makita Edwards. It was a ceiling fan, and, and it was uh, representative in a number of ways of the stories that I heard going door to door uh, in Atlanta, where this company owns 6,000 homes, and also in Los Angeles, where they control about 4,000 homes. Uh, these were foreclosures, right? So they were not in the best of shape. Uh, to begin with. Uh, the families who owned them before couldn't necessarily uh, take care of them as well as they'd like. Uh, and then, when we looked at the SEC filings of this company, Colony Starwood Homes, we found that they spent, on average, just $800 a year per home on maintenance. So this family moves in last August. Uh, they live without heat. Um, they have a roof that leaks. They keep calling and calling an 800 number uh, for uh, Waypoint Homes, which is the trade name that this company operates under. And then one day, uh, she's lying in bed with her newborn baby, and the ceiling, which has been leaking, uh, the, the ceiling fan just falls on their bed. And the other important thing about this family, and just listening to Alec talk about the fees that were charged by Kushner's company, fees became a very important uh, revenue source for this company as well. Uh, their SEC filings show last year they charged $26 million in fees and tenant clawbacks uh, last year. And when you look into why it is or that they were able that they filed so many eviction notices against their tenants, you talk to tenants uh, like Makita Edwards, uh, who got uh, eviction notices in six straight months. Uh, they end up in this cycle of eviction notices and late fees. Uh, so they were late on their month, their rent the very first month they moved in, and suddenly they have a $95 late fee. Uh, they're asked to pay the landlord's court costs. Uh, they're asked to pay the landlord's lawyer's fees. Uh, they're even asked to pay the process server who served them with the eviction notice almost $200 on top of their rent. Uh, they pay that. They're allowed to stay. But now they're late on the next month's rent, and now they have another $200 in late fees and other charges. And this goes on uh, for six months, even as they're living in these uh, really uninhabitable conditions. And, and Ari, there have been other uh, investor groups like Blackstone that, after the Great Recession, started buying up foreclosed homes. Uh, did you discern anything different around, uh, about how this company was dealing with, with the homeowners? Are they trying to get everybody out to then sell the homes once the housing market uh, recovers? Um, well, what I thought was interesting about this company, Colony, uh, and also uh, Blackstone and some of the other investors is that they found a way to flip their investment. Uh, in these properties without actually flipping the homes. Uh, they've created a brand new type of mortgage-backed security. Uh, you remember uh, the mortgage-backed securities uh, that helped uh, tank our economy uh, uh, before the housing bust, where lots of bad loans were bundled together, uh, and then when property values started to slip, the whole economy collapsed. Uh, this is a different kind of mortgage-backed security. It's brand new uh, since the bust. Tom Barrick uh, helped invent uh, this type of mortgage-backed security, where they took all of these homes that they had bought with cash outright all around the country and bundled them together into huge mortgage-backed securities, uh, which was basically like taking a gigantic home equity line of credit out of all these houses. So uh, this one house that I'm talking about in Atlanta, uh, it is uh, owned by a mortgage-backed security. Uh, another house in Los Angeles uh, that uh, I spent a lot of time reporting on where a tenant got an eviction notice over a $49.33 late fee is also owned by a mortgage-backed security, uh, $514 million, more than 3,000 homes bundled together. Aaron, we just have together. 20 seconds, but Tom Barrick stepped down after your piece. Yes, that's right. He uh, Late Friday, our piece ran uh, on Thursday morning, and late Friday, he sold all of his stock in this company. Uh, that we're talking about and resigned from its board of trustees. So he's moving on to other pastures. He made a lot of money off of selling his stock. And uh, now the tenants uh, in these 31,000 homes uh, are left to wonder uh, what's next now that the creator of this, the friend of the president, is moving on.
Aaron Glantz, I want to thank you for being with us. Senior reporter at Reveal will link to your piece. And a very special thanks to Nicole Salazar, who produced our Puerto Rican Day Parade piece. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.